So let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. So Michael V. Morris is an Intel Xeon. Did I pronounce that correct? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, processor power and performance lab coordinator, currently working for Intel Corporation. Mike has 30, over 35 years in the computer industry, 25 at Intel, where he loves the culture of working together to solve challenging and complex problems. And I can only imagine. <laughs> Mike's philosophy is to serve Jesus Christ by serving others and to make the most of those opportunities. He currently lives in Aliso Viejo, California with his wife, Terry, and has two grown sons, Matthew and Stephen. Besides his Intel job and weekend ministry opportunities, Mike's favorite thing to do is to head to Crystal Cove Beach in Laguna and to body surf. So first of all, Mike, welcome to Thanks. our lecture series today. We're so happy to have you. Thanks, Eva Marie. And also, I would say probably what a change from going from a lab to Crystal Cove. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> much less stressful <laughs> oh excellent so let me go ahead then and um, take it away and thank you again for joining us today so you got it mike okay eva marie let me know when you can see what i'm sharing yep we got it Hey everybody, uh, good morning and happy Friday to you. And um, when I originally uh, spoke with Eva Marie and we talked about doing this, it, we were I was originally going to work or uh, speak about computers and technology and <clears throat> where we've been and uh, where we're at now. And then over the few months <laughs> since we talk, it's kind of morphed into, uh, well, why don't we, you know, speak about artificial intelligence because there's a lot going on in the news right now. And it's a pretty controversial subject. Uh, and so I'm gonna give kind of a high level, level overview um, of where we're at now and where we've started and just some of the controversies around it. And um, so why don't we get going? So, uh, let's see here. So for the introduction to artificial intelligence, now I've added, I've kept all of the text uh, in these slides and these will be available uh, through Eva Marie uh, when I'm done with this chat. There's nothing <laughs> proprietary in here that I can't share. So it's totally open and uh, you guys will be able to access it uh, after, after we're done here. So let me start uh, with the introduction. What is, what is AI? What is artificial intelligence? Uh, so it's, it's defined as the ability of a computer or a machine to learn from its experiences, similar to humans, and respond to new situations in the same way that a human can. Um, the goal is to create machines that can think and act just like humans do. Um, that's been around for a long time, right? And just computers in general. And then AI has been, uh, it's been around actually for centuries, since the 40s really, uh, but it's only in the last few decades that uh, we've seen some major advancements with AI. Uh, when we're speaking in con uh, computer programming terms, uh, it can be thought of as a program that's capable of learning and thinking. It's possible to consider anything to be artificial intelligent if it, intelligence if it consists of a programming performing a task that we'd normally assume a human would perform. So uh, before we go any further and get into the, the three types of AI and, and how it affects us in our culture, uh, Eva, can you go ahead and cue this first video? Gives a, a, a brief overview. And John decided to watch the latest movie recommended by Netflix. At My apologies. Let me just scoot it back again to make sure we get everything. There you go. Enjoy. 
It's a weekend, and John decided to watch the latest movie recommended by Netflix at his friend's place. Before heading out, he asked Siri about the weather and realized it would rain. So he decided to take his Tesla for the long journey and switched to autopilot on the highway. After coming home from the eventful day, he started wondering how technology has made his life easy. He did some research on the internet and found out that Netflix, Siri, and Tesla are all using AI. So what is AI? AI, or artificial intelligence, is nothing but making computers-based machines think and act like humans. Artificial intelligence is not a new term. John McCarthy, a computer scientist, coined the term artificial intelligence back in 1956. But it took time to evolve as it demanded heavy computing power. Artificial intelligence is not confined to just movie recommendations and virtual assistants. Broadly classifying, there are three types of AI. Artificial narrow intelligence, also called weak AI, is the stage where machines can perform a specific task. Netflix, Siri, chatbots, facial recommendation systems are all examples of artificial narrow intelligence. Next up, we have artificial general intelligence, referred to as an intelligent agent's capacity to comprehend or pick up any intellectual skill that a human can. We are halfway into successfully implementing this space. IBM's Watson Supercomputer and GPT-3 fall under this category. And lastly, artificial superintelligence. It is the stage where machines surpass human intelligence. You might have seen this in movies and imagined how the world would be if machines occupied it. Fascinated by this, John did more research and found out that machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing are all connected with artificial intelligence. Machine learning, a subset of AI, is the process of automating and enhancing how computers learn from their experiences without human help. Machine learning can be used in email spam detection, medical diagnosis, etc. Deep learning can be considered a subset of machine learning. It is a field that is based on learning and improving on its own by examining computer algorithms. While machine learning uses simpler concepts, deep learning works with artificial neural networks, which are designed to imitate the human brain. This technology can be applied in face recognition, speech recognition, and many more applications. Natural language processing, popularly known as NLP, can be defined as the ability of machines to learn human language and translate it. Chatbots fall under this category. Artificial intelligence is advancing in every crucial field like healthcare, education, robotics, banking, e-commerce, and the list goes on. Like in healthcare, AI is used to identify diseases, helping healthcare service providers and their patients make better treatment and lifestyle decisions. Coming to the education sector, AI is helping teachers automate grading, organizing, and facilitating parent-guardian conversations. In robotics, AI-powered robots employ real-time updates to detect obstructions in their path and instantaneously design their routes. Artificial intelligence provides advanced data analytics that is transforming banking by reducing fraud and enhancing compliance. With this growing demand for AI, more and more industries are looking for AI engineers who can help them develop intelligent systems and offer them lucrative salaries going north of $120,000. The future of AI looks promising with the AI market expected to reach $190 billion by 2025. So on that note, I have a question for you. Artificial intelligence is about playing a computer game, creating a device using your own intelligence, to program an intelligent machine, investing your brain power in a machine. Give the correct answer along with Okay, thank you, Eva. So I'll start sharing again. Okay, so just a recap. Uh, the, in the video just now, they talked about three uh, main types of AI, and um, one, of, one of them is weak AI, which focuses on one task and cannot perform beyond its limitations, it's, which is common in our daily lives. Then there's strong AI, which can understand and learn any intellectual task that a human being can. Um, you know, and it's in parentheses, researchers are striving to reach strong AI. In other words, we're not there yet. Uh, and then the, the future, 
uh, maybe, is this super AI, which surpasses human intelligence and can perform any task better than a human. Uh, so to me, uh, still a concept. And uh, when you say super AI, I think that's kind of super scary. <laughs> And uh, Eva, I just uh, thought that we could stop here for a second and just get some thoughts. Sure. So this is one of those opportunities, uh, students, that, you know, what are your thoughts um, about, about AI right now, especially the super AI? And you can put um, your uh, point of view or, or your thoughts. Go ahead and put it in the chat uh, right now. We'll give you a few moments. If you'd like to share. So. Um, if not, that's OK, too, because we'll have plenty of other yeah, <laughs> opportunities yeah. for yeah. you to give your thoughts and concerns. <laughs> um, actually, they're starting to come in. Uh, one student says that. Uh, they think it's the decline of human civilization. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, ah. thank you. Yeah, another one, um, unlimited potential, but a little like the wild, wild west. That's a great one. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank uh, you. Uh, oh, and here's a, here's a good point, too, uh, Mike. Scary <laughs> because it doesn't have a conscience. Right, and we're actually going to get to that later on in the slides about ethical type stuff. Yep. Yes, um, and then and that same note is you know a significant benefits along with significant consequences, yes. like the loss of person jobs. Yes. Yep, and we'll be covering that too. Yes, and another yeah, that's a concern. <laughs> and another good one is possible elimination of artistry. Because we know e, uh, AI is now coming to the arts. Yes. Yeah. Um, yep. And then um, someone, or, though, however, another person puts about how um, it goes um, AI is increasing exposure to doctors. So looking forward to what AI's use in medical diagnosis and treatments, and doctors are humans and they do make human mistakes. So that's another good point. Right. So, yeah, later on also we'll cover the medical benefits of it. And there's even the advantages I've kind of put at a little grade level uh, next to each one of the advantages. And, you know, we'll get your feedback on, on how you would grade those advantages as well. Yes, excellent. So uh, thank you for, for that, Mike. Uh, go, continue sure. on. This is great. Okay. So those were the three main types of, of of AI for right now. Um, just some real quick uh, AI terms. Machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence that deals with systems that are able to acquire their own knowledge or learn by extracting patterns from data instead of having those patterns provided them directly via programming. So it's, it's when you think of machine learning, it's just these uh, these, these patterns or this data that's just run over and over and over again, or these algorithms. Machine learning algorithms build a, build a model based on sample data known as training data. Um, and training is a big word when it comes to AI. In order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so, machine learning algorithms are used in a wide variety of applications such as medicine, uh, all of this stuff is what we're actually currently using, email filtering, speech recognition, agriculture even, and computer vision, where it's difficult or unfeasible to develop conventional algorithms to perform the needed tasks. A subset of machine learning is closely related to computational statistics. So that's a big thing right now, data statistics, uh, marketing, medical, uh, financial markets, stock market trends, right? Uh, you know, AI takes those computational statistics and this is where it kind of gets to the, maybe the unfair advantage part where if you have a big AI machine that's, that's doing trading on the stock market, uh, <laughs> you know, 
just the normal day trader, how is he going to compete with the big AI machine that's using computational statistics to trade? And those, you know, those, you know, think of predictive behavior, right? So those predictions are using computers, but not all machine learning is statistical learning. The study of mathematical optimization delivers methods, theory, and application domains to the field of machine learning. Data mining, which is big right now, is a related field of study focusing on exploratory data analysis through unsupervised learning. Some implementations of machine learning use data and neural networks. Uh, neural networks is just a way to um, train computers to basically work like our brains do. Uh, so it, it, it's learning to use data and neural networks in a way that mimics the working of the biological brain. In its application across business, problems, machine learning is also referred to as predictive analytics. So uh, Eva, if you wanna, you know, machine learning is, uh, or deep learning, <laughs> pardon the pun, is a pretty deep subject. So we've got another video uh, that we're gonna watch. So Eva, if you could cue that up. Fair warning. If you're feeling a little hungry right now, you might want to pause this video and grab a snack before continuing because I'm going to explain the difference between machine learning and deep learning by talking about pizza. Delicious, tasty pizza. Now, before we get to that, let's, let's address the fundamental question here. What is the difference between between these two terms. Well, put simply, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Actually, the, the hierarchy goes like this. At the top, we have AI, or artificial intelligence. Now, a subfield of AI is ML, or machine learning. Beneath that, then we have NN, or neural networks, and they make up the backbone of deep learning algorithms, DL. And here on the IBM Technology Channel, we have a whole bunch of videos on these topics. You might want to consider subscribing. Now, machine learning algorithms leverage structured, labeled data to make predictions. So let's build one a model to determine whether we should order pizza for dinner. There are three main factors that influence that decision, so let's map those out as inputs. The first of those inputs we'll call x1. And x1 asks, will it save time by ordering out? We can say yes with a 1 or no with a 0. Yes, it will, so x, that equals 1. Now, x2, that input says, will I lose weight by ordering pizza? That's a zero. I'm, I'm ordering all the toppings. And x3, will it save me money? Actually, I have a coupon for a free pizza today, so that's a one. Now, look, these binary responses, ones and zeros, I'm using them for simplicity, but neurons in a network can represent values from, well, everything to everything, negative infinity to positive infinity. With our inputs defined, we can assign weights to determine importance. Larger weights make a single input's contribution to the output more significant compared to other inputs. Now, my threshold here is five. So let's weight each one of these. W1, um, well, I'm going to give this a full five because I value my time. At W2, uh, this was the will I lose weight one. I'm going to rate this a three because I have some interest in keeping in shape. And for W3, I'm going to give this a two 
because look, either way, this isn't going to break the bank to order dinner. Now, we plug these weights into our model, and using an activation function, we can calculate the output, which in this case is the decision to order pizza or not. So to calculate that, we're going to calculate the y hat, and we're going to use these weights and these inputs. So here we've got 1 times 5, we've got 0 times 3, and we've got 1 times 2. And we need to consider as well our threshold, which was 5. So that gives us, if we just add these up, 1 times 5, that's 5, plus 0 times 3, that's 0, plus 1 times 2, that's 2, minus 5. Well, that gives us a total of positive 2. And because the output is a positive number, this correlates to pizza night. OK, so that's machine learning. But what differentiates deep learning? Well, the answer to that is more than three. As in, a neural network is considered a deep neural network if it consists of more than three layers, and that includes the input and the output layer. So we've got our input and output. We have multiple layers in the middle, and this would be considered a deep learning network. Classical machine learning is more dependent on human intervention to learn. Human experts, well, they determine a hierarchy of features to understand the differences between data inputs. So if I showed you a series of images of different types of fast food, like pizza, burger, and taco, you could label these in a data set for processing by the neural network. A human expert here has determined the characteristics which distinguish each picture as the specific fast food type. So, for example, it might be the bread of each food type might be a distinguishing feature across each picture. Now, this is known as supervised learning because the process incorporates human intervention or human supervision. Deep machine learning doesn't necessarily require a labeled data set. It can ingest unstructured data in its raw form, like text and images, and it can automatically determine the set of features which distinguish pizza, burger, and taco from one another. By observing patterns in the data, a deep learning model can cluster inputs appropriately. These algorithms discover hidden patterns of data groupings without the need for human intervention, and they're known as unsupervised learning. Most deep neural networks are feed forward. That means that they go in one direction, from the input to the output. However, you can also train your model through something called backpropagation. That is, it moves in the opposite direction from output to input. Backpropagation allows us to calculate and attribute the error associated with each neuron and allows us to adjust and fit the algorithm appropriately. So when we talk about machine learning and deep learning, we're essentially talking about the same field of study. Neural networks, they're the foundation of both types of learning, and both are considered subfields of AI. The main distinction between the two are that number of layers in a neural network, more than three, and whether or not human intervention is required to label data. Pizza, burgers, tacos, yeah, that's, uh, that's enough for today. It's time for lunch. Oh, oh, and before I go, if you did enjoy this video, here are some others you might also Thanks, Eva. So, you know, folks, that's uh, <laughs> a little bit complex. However, I thought that that video would be helpful to just even get a start of the complexities of AI. And it goes, it's really vast. And uh, like we said before, this has been, you know, people have been working on this artificial intelligence since the 40s. <laughs> so this is where it is now. 
Uh, it's gotten to, it's gotten to this neural network stuff, the machine learning, the deep learning, uh, you know, basically it's trying to model our brain. He's talking about input and output. Our brain just does that by default. So artificial intelligence, you could just think of it as we're just thinking of a way to duplicate or model what our brains are already doing. Um, you know, to help, to help in our society, hopefully help. So anyway, let me, let me kind of uh, continue on here. There's some more terms. So just to expand more on when he was talking about neural networks, uh, artificial intelligence, cognitive modeling, and neural networks are information processing paradigms inspired by how biological neural systems process data. Artificial intelligence and cognitive modeling, like exactly like what our brain does, try to tries to simulate some properties of biological our brains neural networks. In the artificial intelligence field, artificial neural networks have been applied successfully to speech recognition, image analysis, and adaptive control in order to construct software agents, computer programs. Uh, you know, like as in computer and video games or autonomous robots. Historically, digital computers evolved from the, the von Neumann model and operate via the execution of explicit instructions, just real similar to what a computer already does via access to memory by a number of processors. On the other hand, the origins of neural networks are based on efforts to model information processing in biological systems is just a complicated way to say our brains, our biology, unlike the von Neumann model, neural network computing does not separate memory and processing. Neural network theory has served to identify better how the neurons in the brain function and provide the basis for efforts to create artificial intelligence. So uh, we're going to... Uh, you know, watch another video, which is just going to explain neural networks a little bit better. Uh, if you can cue that one up, Eva. Here are five things to know about neural networks in in under five minutes. Number one, neural networks are composed of node layers. There is an input node layer, there is a hidden layer, and there is an output layer. And these neural networks reflect the behavior of the human brain, allowing computer programs to recognize patterns and solve common problems in the fields of AI and deep learning. In fact, we should be describing this as an artificial neural network or an ANN to distinguish it from the very unartificial neural network that's operating in our heads. Now, think of each node or artificial neuron as its own linear regression model. That's, that's number two. Linear regression is a mathematical model that's used to predict future events. The weights of the connections between the nodes determines how much influence each input has on the output. So each node is composed of input data, weights, a bias or a threshold, and then an output. Now data is passed from one layer in the neural network to the next in what is known as a feed forward network. Number three. To illustrate this, let's consider what a single node in our neural network might look like to decide, should we go surfing? The decision to go or not is our predicted outcome, or known as our Y hat. Let's assume there are three factors influencing our decision. Uh, the wave's good, one for yes or zero for no. The waves are pumping, so x1 equals one on the yes. Uh, is the lineup empty? Well, unfortunately not, so that gets a zero. And then let's consider, is it shark free out there? That's X3. And uh, yeah, no shark attacks have been reported. Now to each decision, we assign a weight based on its importance on a scale of zero to five. So let's say that the waves, we're gonna score that one. Yeah, no, this is important, let's give it a five. And uh, for the crowds, that's W2. 
Yeah, not so important. We'll give that a two. And uh, sharks, well, we'll give that a score of a four. Now, we can plug in these values into the formula to get the desired output. So, y hat equals 1 times 5 plus 0 times 2 plus 1 times 4, then minus 3, that's our threshold, and that gives us a value of 6. 6 is greater than 0, so the output of this node is 1. We're going surfing. And if we adjust the weights of the threshold, we can achieve different outcomes. Number four. Well, yes, but, but, but number four. Neural networks rely on training data to learn and improve their accuracy over time. We leverage supervised learning or labeled data sets to train the algorithm. As we train the model, we will want to evaluate its accuracy using something called a cost function. Ultimately, the goal is to minimize our cost function to ensure the correctness of fit for any given observation. And that happens as the model adjusts its weights and biases to fit the training data set through what's known as gradient descent, allowing the model to determine the direction to take to reduce errors or, more specifically, minimize the cost function. And then finally, number five, there are multiple types of neural networks beyond the feed-forward neural network that we've described here. For example, there are convolutional neural networks, known as CNNs, which have a unique architecture that's well suited for identifying patterns like image recognition. And there are recurrent neural networks, or RNNs, which are identified by their feedback loops. And RNNs are primarily leveraged using time series data to make predictions about future events like sales forecasting. So, five things in five minutes. Thank you, Eva. Maria. <laughs> oh, let me get this one up here. Okay, so again, you can see um, this is just talking about a neural network function to just decide if you want to go surfing or not. <laughs> So again, started in the 40s, um, you know, where we are now, and just, this is just basic artificial intelligence and predictive behavior and modeling our brain and decision making. Um, you can see how long it took us to get to how we model neural networks or our biological brains, right? It's pretty complicated. And um, the reason why I wanted to focus on neural networks is just to show everybody what AI is all about, and that is basically modeling how our brain works. So let me move on here. So now, uh, moving on from kind of the basics of AI, maybe it doesn't seem so basic, seems kind of complicated, but um, I want to move on to different usage models of AI. One of them is this chat GPT, which uh, I'm going to read about. And one of the reasons why I left the text in here uh, to read through is so that if you guys want to have these, uh, get a, access to these slides after this is done, uh, you know, you could, you could kind of go over this again and educate yourself because chat GPT is starting to pop up a lot in the news. And uh, let, me, let me read a little bit about right now what it's all about. So it's a, an AI chat bot, uh, and I'll get to that in a second, what a chat bot is. It uses natural language processing to create human-like conversational dialogue. The language model can respond to questions and compose various written con content, including articles, social media posts, essays, code, and emails. It actually does a lot more than that, which is what you'll see. Chat GPT is a form of generative, generative uh, AI, a tool that lets users uh, enter prompts to receive human-like images, text videos that are created by AI. Chat GPT is similar to the automated chat services found on customer service websites, uh, which <laughs> I don't know what your uh, opinion is of those, but um, I'm always asking, can I just get a hold of a real person, please? But anyway, as people can ask it questions or request clarification to chat GPT's replies. The GPT stands for Generative 
pre-trained transformer, which refers to how chat GPT processes requests and formulates responses. Chat GPT is trained with reinforcement learning through human feedback and reward models that rank the best responses. This feedback helps augment chat GPT with machine learning, which we just learned about to improve future responses. So who created chat GPT? So this is where it gets interesting. Uh, OpenAI, uh, an AI research company created and launched Chat GPT in November of 2022, it was founded by a group of entrepreneurs and researchers, including Elon Musk and Sam Altman in 2015. OpenAI is backed by several investors with Microsoft being the most notable. OpenAI also created DAL-E, an alt text to art generator. How does ChatGPT work? ChatGPT works through its generative pre-trained transformer, which uses specialized algorithms to find patterns within data sequences. ChatGPT uses the GPT-3 language model, a neural network machine. Here we are talking about neural networks again, you know, things that model our brain. Uh, to do machine learning that model the third generation of generative pre-trained transformer, the transformer pulls from a significant amount of data to formulate a response. We go on here. How does ChatGP work? Continue chat, chat GPT uses deep learning, what we just learned about a subset of machine learning to produce human-like text through transformer neural networks. The transformer predicts text. Here it is. The this predict predictive behavior, including the next word, sentence, or paragraph based on its training data's typical sequence. Training begins with generic data, then moves to more tailored data for a specific task. ChatGPT was trained with on online text to learn the human language, and then it uses transcripts to learn the basics of conversations. Human trainers provide conversations and rank the responses. These reward models help determine the best answers to keep training the chat bot. Users can upvote or downvote its response by clicking on thumbs up or thumbs down for the icons to uh, beside the answer. Users can also provide additional written feedback to improve and fine tune future dialogue. So what kind of questions can users ask ChatGPT? Users can ask ChatGPT a variety of questions, including simple or more complex questions, such as what is the meaning of life? So this sounds like, you know, Siri on your iPhone, right? Or what year did New York become a state? ChatGPT is proficient with STEM disciplines and can debug or write code. Uh, this is very helpful in the business that I'm in, which is validation of processors, where we write validation scripts um, and also scripts that debug problems. There is no limitation to the types of questions to ask ChatGPT. However, ChatGPT uses data up to the year 2021, so it has no knowledge of events and data past that year. And since it is a con conversational chatbot, users can ask more for more information or ask it to try again when generating text. Now, this is that kind of input slash output thing that our, our video was just talking about. Um, it almost reminds me of uh, the Iron Man movies where uh, the Iron Man guy is, you know, has this AI type a computer that's always going 24 hours a day and he's talking to him and he's asking him questions and the computer's giving him feedback and they're building these these Iron Man suits and all that. That's exactly uh, very similar to this ch chat GPT um, program. So just uh, some examples of how people are using chat GPT. Uh, it's pretty versatile, <laughs> and we'll see below. And it's used for more than just human conversations. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more at the ethics of it. Uh, and people use chat GPT to do the following code computer programs. This is like what I was just talking about for 
people that work in computer companies that do validation, uh, we, we use a lot of computer programs to help with uh, validation uh, to make sure that our chips are working correctly and doing what they're supposed to do and there's no bugs. Um, you can use it to compose music, draft emails, summarize articles, podcasts or presentations, uh, script social media posts, create a title for an article, solve math problems. And this is where we get into, okay, are kids going to start using this chat GPT to do their homework for them? Uh, it's a very real um, concern. Uh, discover keywords for search engine optimization, create articles, blog posts, and quizzes for websites, reward or reword existing content for a different medium, such as a presentation transcript for a blog post, formulate product descriptions, play games, assist with job searches, including writing resumes and cover letters even, uh, to ask trivia questions or describe complex topics more simply. Now there's a 15 minute video that we're not gonna watch because I'm trying to kind of keep you guys riveted. Uh, but um, this chat GPT, you're gonna start hearing a lot more about this um, in the news. And I have a feeling it's gonna become quite controversial, uh, especially if, if young people, high school level, you know, I mean, it's, there's, it's a double-edged edged sword, right? So one thing is learning it would probably be good because uh, there's mathematics and they're, they're, you know, our kids are learning a lot by just learning these AI uh, uh, models like ChatGPT. However, then the ethics part of it becomes, well, my kid's getting straight A's because he's using ChatGPT. Right, so it's just some food for thought, something to chew on. Um, let's go away from that for right now and let's talk about kind of the pioneers of AI. Um, these are really interesting guys. So, this first one is Alan Turing, and um, he's one of the most iconic figures when it comes to AI, and for good reason. He's often referred to the, as the father of modern computing and artificial intelligence. He's famous for break, help, helping to break the German Enigma code during World War I, a feat that many believed was completely impossible. Uh, he also was a pioneer in both machine learning and programming, having composed one of the earliest computer programs back in the 1940s. He also postulated that machines could eventually be programmed to think and act like humans. So obviously Alan Turing was way ahead of his time. Um, besides his major contributions in computing and AI research, Turing is also remembered for his groundbreaking theories on cellular, cellular autonomata, an uh, incredible feat since computers weren't readily available at the time. Again, this guy was way ahead of his time. Uh, so while Turing's name may be lost on most people today, he'll forever be remembered by those in the field of computer science and artificial intelligence as one of its founding fathers. So I have a question for you guys. Uh, what is the Turing test? So Eve, I don't know if, if anybody's going to uh, offer this in the chat. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring up the answer. Well, well, let's give it a second. If anybody might know what the Turing test is, please go ahead and drop it in into chat we'll see and i can give you guys a hint there was a really good movie that had to do with uh uh alan turing okay so maybe mike you should just give us the <laughs> answer and then and the students can say oh yes i knew that yes i knew that <laughs> so the answer is the turing test it was originally called the imitation game that will give you an idea of the if that rings a bell, by Alan Turing in 1950, it's a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human. And then I put in parentheses also a really cool movie. So Benedict Cumberbatch was the star of the imitation game. It, it came out a few years ago and it was a really good movie. And I don't know, Eva, if it 
maybe you know better than I do if it won any Academy Awards, but um, it, it was it was a really good movie. Um, so that's what the Turing test is, and that's all about Alan Turing. Sorry, go ahead, Eva. Oh, no, I just said we have a couple of students who have, have echoed exactly. So perhaps it was we weren't giving them enough time to type. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So he's a, he's an interesting guy. And like I said, this guy was a visionary. I mean, he was a really smart dude. So other pioneers are a McCarthy. And he spent he has kind of specialized in this machine learning. And he's he's one of uh, one of the other pioneers. Yeah, he coined the term artificial intelligence in 1955. He also invented Lisp, the first language used for AI programming. So, so what did he contribute to the field of AI? He was a key figure in introducing and defining the concepts of machine learning, which is now a major field within artificial intelligence. Again, this guy, this is another guy way ahead of his time, uh, thinking wise. McCarthy advocated for algorithms that could learn from data and adapt to new situations so that machines could become smarter over time. He was also a major proponent of using games as a way to teach AI how to effectively make decisions, an idea that forms a part of game playing AIs like Deep Blue and AlphaGo today. In addition, he developed the first algorith algorithmic chess playing program called Chess 4.5 this program was capable of competing against other human players. And even though its performance wasn't particularly good compared to today's standards, it marked an important milestone in the development of game playing AIs. So you, we all know with we have kids that gaming is a big deal right now. Overall, John MacArthur or McCarthy made groundbreaking contributions to the field of artificial intelligence and his work still serves as a foundation for many modern advances in AI. So when you think of John McCarthy, you can look at PlayStations and Xboxes and, and all of these uh, gaming devices that our kids use. So now I, I kind of blew it. I already clicked too soon. My question was, was what is deep blue? And uh, I already brought the uh, uh, answer up prematurely, Eva Marie. So <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, no, that's okay. The students probably appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. The Deep Blue, this is really interesting, was a chess playing expert system run on a unique purpose built IBM supercomputer. It was the first computer to win a game and the first to win a match against a reigning world chess champion. Gary Kasparov under regular time controls. So this was, you know, it, it, you know, Deep Blue has to do with, with this purpose-built IBM supercomputer. And it was programmed with artificial intelligence as like we talked about John McCarthy in, in a game playing uh, example, right? And you know, this happened years and years ago, but this computer beat this world chess champion, right, in a chess game. So right there, that kind of tells you, okay, wow, there's been a lot of work done by humans on artificial intelligence, and now artificial intelligence is slowly progressing, right, to the point to where it can even, you know, beat this chess champion world champion in a chess game. So let me go here. There's another guy named Marvin Minsky. Uh, he was an American cognitive scientist who is known as a pioneer in AI research as well. Minsky was born in New York in 1927 and attended Harvard, where he worked with John McCarthy to develop the first AI laboratory at, the Mass, at MIT, basically. So him and John McCarthy were both kind of uh, a team uh, when it comes to AI. And he's, his research was focused on researching artificial neural networks, you know, emulating our brains and methods of problem solving, which ultimately laid the groundwork for the development of AI-based systems. He also helped establish the field of artificial intelligence as an academic discipline in its own right. 
In addition to his groundbreaking research, Minsky also developed important teaching methods, including the frame theory, which suggests the questions can be formulated more precisely when broken down into hierarchical, hier hierarchical structures. Sorry, I, those are kind of words I have problems pronouncing. This concept has been adapted by AI researchers to simulate human reasoning. So here's his, I guess you could say that Marvin Minsky was more focused on emulating our brain when it comes to reasoning and thought processing. Um, so he's considered one of the pioneers of our modern artificial intelligence and his contributions are still relevant today. He passed away at age 88 in 2016, but even after his death, his work, his work continues to inspire future de generations of AI researchers. So definitely one of the founding fathers. So, there's also some current pioneers, I guess you could say, of AI. Um, there's plenty of people right now, and, and as we get more into these slides towards the end, uh, there's actually these, uh, these kind of uh, head AI guys for different companies like Google and other companies right now. They've been in the news lately because of AI and some interesting decisions that they've made. And we'll get into that. But those current guys are this uh, Fifi Lee. He's the director of Stanford Artificial Intelligence, a lab and a professor in both computer science and electrical engineering. She's responsible for breakthroughs like ImageNet, no, excuse me, a large database of annotated images for teaching computers to see. So this one has to do with sight. Andrew Ng. Andrew Ng has been at the forefront of AI research since he started teaching machine learning at Stanford in 2002. He left Google and Baidu after leading their artificial intelligence groups and now leads Landing AI, an AI platform that helps traditional companies be competitive in the digital economy. And then Jan LeCun uh, is probably best known for inventing convolutional neural networks, CNNs. <laughs> Uh, which can interpret uh, images given to them by humans and make decisions based on what they see, another sight-based AI. He's currently the chief uh, AI scientist at Facebook and was behind much of the company's early work on facial recognition technology. There are just some, these are just some examples of the current pioneers in AI. There are many more leading the field today. Yes, they're all over the place. They work for Google, like we said, Facebook, Microsoft, Intel, AMD, all these high tech companies. NVIDIA is huge in AI and building it into their chips. So those are the current guys. Then just to conclude, um, uh, just a conclusion for these AI pioneers. Um, AI is the history of it's rich and complex, though it may be difficult to pinpoint the single individual who created AI, it's clear that the influential development of AI is the result of a collaboration of people, ideas, and technologies. From Turing to MacArthur, McCarthy, the pioneers of AI have pushed the boundaries of what is possible in the realm of technology and research. While AI is still in its infancy, imagine that, I mean, it seems like we've got to a, a pretty complex state. <laughs> It's only sure to grow and expand further as new minds, technologies, and applications come together to continue to discover and develop the future of AI. All right, moving on. So we're gonna kind of quickly go through the advantages uh, and also the disadvantages of AI. And, um, you know, Eva, I, I think the chat can be open as I go through these. I've kind of in parentheses put uh, where I thought that these advantages, uh, the research that I've done, these opinions that these are advantages, I'm grading those opinions, <laughs> okay? So the first one is reduction in human error. Okay, I, I gave that a grade A. One of the biggest advantages of artificial intelligence is that it can significantly reduce errors and increase accuracy and precision. 
The decisions taken by AI in every step is decided by information previously gathered and a certain set of algorithms. This goes back to all of the training uh, that we were talking about earlier uh, that just happens in rip, you know, rip, repeatedly over and over again. When programmed properly, these errors can be reduced to null. So in other words, with all this AI work, the training, uh, all of these algorithms, as they get better and better at these, they reduce the, uh, the human error factor. So number two is zero risk. I said, okay, I, I could give this a great A. Another big advantage of AI is that humans can overcome many risks by letting AI robots do for them or, or what, by letting AI robots do things for us. Sorry, that's worded wrong. <laughs> Whether it can be diffusing a bomb, going to a space, exploring the deepest parts of oceans, machines with metal bodies that are resistant in nature and can survive unfriendly atmosphere. Moreover, they can provide accurate work with greater responsibility and uh, will not wear out easily. Well, uh, I guess I don't completely agree with that because if you're having a, a robot diffuse a bomb, uh, <laughs> they're gonna wear out pretty quickly. <laughs> oh, uh, anyway, so, but overall I said, okay, that's a good thing. I'll, I'll give that a great A. So three, 24 by seven availability. Um, there are many studies that show humans are productive only about three to four hours a day. Hmm, okay. Humans also need breaks and time off to balance their work life and personal life, yes. But AI can work endlessly without breaks. They think much faster than humans and perform multiple tasks at a time with accurate results. They can even handle tedious repetitive jobs easily with the help of AI algorithms. So, you know, I think this is a good thing, um, but when we, later on get into the ethical ramifications of AI. We'll look at maybe these repetitive jobs, these tedious repetitive jobs are gonna be taken away from humans. We'll see. All right, number four, digital assistants. Um, Chatbots over humans, I put this, this is my words, can be really frustrating, not sure this is an advantage. I gave this a D because Whoever is called to, if their laptop is messing up and uh, they're calling for support and they get these chat bots or these automatic or automated responses, it can be really super frustrating. You know automatically that you're not talking to a human who has reasoning, who can understand your frustration. Uh, it's like input and you're inputting and the output you're getting back from these chat bots is just not human and it's very frustrating. So let me read this real quick. Some of the most technologically advanced companies engage with users using digital assistance, which eliminates the need for human personnel. That's hence my D grade. Many websites utilize digital assistance to deliver user requested content. We can discuss our search with them in conversation. Some chat bots are built in a way that makes it difficult to tell whether we are conversing with a human or a chat bot. I disagree with that. I can always tell when I'm, when I'm uh, talking to a chat bot or an automated support response. Um, we all know that businesses have a customer service crew that must address the doubts and concerns of the patrons. Businesses can create a chat bot or voice bot that can answer all of their client, clients' questions using AI. Uh, so I don't think they're there yet uh, from what I've seen when I've um, called support. So new inventions, medical. Okay, this is a, definitely a great A uh, in my opinion. And practically every field, AI is the driving force behind numerous innovations that will aid humans in resolving the majority of challenging issues. For instance, recent advances in AI-based technologies have allowed doctors to detect breast cancer in a woman at an earlier stage. To me, this is a, this is a great aid, no doubt. Number six, unbiased decisions. I put no drama. 
you know, these, these AI chatbots, whatever you want to call them, robots, they don't have emotions, right? So human beings are driven by emotions, whether we like it or not. AI, on the other hand, is devoid of emotions and highly practical and rational in its approach. How boring. Anyway, a huge advantage of artificial intelligence is that it doesn't have any biased views, which ensures more accurate decision making. So when I thought more about this, I'm like, okay, uh, there is advantages. So I will give it the benefit of the doubt and give it a grade A. So seven, perform repetitive job tasks. So we will be doing a lot of repetitive tasks as part of our daily work, such as checking documents for flaws and mailing thank you notes, among other things. We may use artificial intelligence to efficiently, efficiently automate these menial chores and even eliminating boring tasks for people, allowing them to focus on being more creative. So I gave this a B. Example, in banks, it's common to see multiple document checks to obtain a loan, which is a, is a time-consuming task for the bank's owner. The owner can expedite the document verification process for the advantage of both the clients and the owner by using an AI cognitive automation. Number eight, uh, daily applications. Today, our everyday lives are entirely dependent on mobile devices and the internet. We use a lot, utilize a variety of apps, including Google Maps, which to me is a complete grade A, Alexa, Siri, Cortana on Windows, okay, Google, talk, uh, taking selfies, making calls, responding to emails, et cetera. With the use of various AI-based techniques, we can also anticipate today's weather and the days ahead. Okay, that's pretty cool. Example, about 20 years ago, you must have asked someone who had already been there for instructions when you were planning a trip. All you need to do now is ask Google where Bangalore is. The best route between you and Bangalore will be displayed along with Bangalore's location on a Google map. So to me, I I've driven across country multiple times. <laughs> Um, Google Maps has been indispensable and very important to not getting lost in some deep, dark part of Indiana or something So uh, at two in the morning. So Google Maps gets a great A uh, for me for these daily applications. Okay, nine, AI in risky situations. One of the main benefits of artificial intelligence is, is by creating an AI robot that can perform perilous tasks on our behalf, we get beyond many of the dangerous restrictions that humans face. So this kind of, uh, you know, kind of mirrors what we already read about in one of the other situations. It can be util utilized effectively in any type of natural or man-made calamity whether it be going to Mars, diffusing a bomb, exploring the deepest regions of the oceans or mining for coal. For instance, the explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear power facility in Ukraine, as any person who came close to the core would have perished in a matter of minutes from the radiation. At that time, there were no AI powered robots that could assist us in reducing the effects of radiation by controlling the fire in its early phases. So that's a great A for me. Uh, 10, faster decision-making. Faster decision-making is another benefit of AI. By automating certain tasks and providing real-time insights, AI can help organizations make faster and more informed decisions. This can be particularly valuable in high-stakes environments where decisions must be made quickly and accurately to prevent costly errors and save lives. Now, this one reminds me or makes me think of, you know, stock trading. And again, I brought it up earlier. If these financial institutions, these trading institutions are using these, these fast AI computers with these algorithms that are making faster decisions on trends where stocks are going, um, you know, and they've done the training on it and they've done the modeling and they've looked at the trends, then, you know, 
who can compete against one of these AI machines that are making these super fast decisions, right? On whether to sell or trade a stock. So that's just food for thought. 11, pattern identification. I gave this a C. Pattern identification is another area where AI excels with its ability to analyze vast amounts of data and identify patterns and trends. Again, um, you know, this is what AI is about, just looking at patterns and trends over and over and over and over again. And then that's the training part. AI can help businesses and organizations better understand customer behavior, market trends, uh, i.e. you're looking at, uh, you order something on Amazon or you go through Google and the next thing you know, you're reading a Google article or Google news and all of a sudden there's all these advertisements for the stuff that you just purchased on Amazon. It's not a coincidence, <laughs> you're, you know, and so they're looking at your trends, they're looking at your habits online, and they use that for marketing and to sell stuff, right? So um, now, you know, if it's if it's make if, if the decisions are to be made uh, quickly and accurately to prevent costly errors or to save lives then that's a big deal. But this is one of those things where it could be used for something that might be unfair or bad or easily, easily by used to, for something that's good like saving lives. So uh, pattern identification. Um, so we, we, I think we just read through that. Um, let me see. So medical applications, this one I gave it a grade A. Um, it, AI has also made significant contributions to the field of medicine with applications ranging from diagnosis and treatment to drug discovery and clinical trials. AI-powered tools can help doctors and researchers analyze patient data, identify potential health risks, and develop personalized treatment plans. This can lead to better health outcomes for patients and help accelerate the development of new medical treatments and technologies. And so this seems like a great A. Um, it does also seem like it's taking some of the burden off of doctors, but we all like to talk one-on-one -on -one, face to face with a doctor and get his opinion. Um, so if AI is backing up his opinions, I suppose it's a good thing. And then also, like we covered earlier, like the detection, uh, early detection of breast cancer and probably a bunch of other types of cancer, uh, the medical application part of AI to me is one of the biggest benefits. All right, so I'm gonna move on. So these are the disadvantages, okay? so. The high cost, the ability to create a machine that can simulate human intelligence is no small feat. It requires plenty of time and resources and can cost a huge deal of money. It also, or AI also needs to operate on the latest hardware and software to stay updated and meet the latest requirements, thus making it quite costly. 13, no creativity. A big disadvantage of AI is that it cannot learn to think outside the box. AI is capable of learning over time with pre-fed data and past experiences, but cannot be created in its own approach. A classic example is the bot Quill, who can write Forbes earning reports. These reports only contain data and facts already provided to the bot. Although it is impressive that a bot can write an article on its own, it lacks the human touch present in other Forbes articles. 14, unemployment. One application, and this is one thing that everybody I think is concerned about, is AI gonna take our jobs away? One application of artificial intelligence is a, it, intelligence is a robot, which is displacing occupations and increasing unemployment in a few cases. Therefore, some claim that there is always a chance of unemployment as a result of chatbots and robots replacing humans. For instance, robots are frequently utilized to replace human resources in manufacturing businesses in some more technology advanced nations like Japan. This is not always the case though, as it creates additional opportunities for humans to work 
while also replacing humans in order to increase efficiency. 15, make humans lazy. AI applications automate the majority of tedious and repetitive tasks. Since we do not have to memorize things or solve puzzles to get the job done, we tend to use our brains less and less. This addiction to AI can cause problems to future generations. 16, no ethics. Ethics and morality are important human features that can be difficult to incorporate into AI. The rapid progress, the progress of AI has raised a number of concerns that one day AI will grow uncontrollably and eventually wipe out humanity. This moment is referred to as the AI singularity. Emotionless. Since early childhood, we've been taught that neither computers nor other machines have feelings. Humans function as a team and team management is essential for achieving goals. However, there is no denying that robots are superior to humans when functioning effectively. But it is also true that human connections, which form the basis of teams, cannot be replaced by computers. Correct. Number 18, no improvement. AI is proficiently is proficient at repeatedly carrying out the same task, but if we want any adjustments or improvements, we must manually alter the codes. AI cannot be accessed and utilized akin to memory intelligence, but it can store infinite data. Machines can only complete tasks they have been developed or programmed for or trained for. If they are asked to complete anything else, they frequently fail or provide useless results which can have significant negative effects. Thus, we are unable to make anything conventional. So the summary is for artificial intelligence, one thing is for sure, it's gonna have massive potential for creating a better world to live in as we looked at the medical part of this. Uh, but the most important role for humans will be to ensure that the rise of, the, of AI doesn't get out of hand. All right, so speaking of AI getting out of hand, here are um, some interesting articles that have just popped up, uh, some controversial AI topics just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Eva, if, yeah, one of them is, um, they call him the godfather of artificial intelligence. Uh, he worked for Google. His name is Jeffrey Hinton. Um, he's British and he just quit Google. And uh, Eva, if you could cue that video right now to kind of further explain uh, what's going on here. Sorry, I forgot to hit the share button. One moment. No worries. Okay, there you go. Uh, Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us. So you left your job with Google in part because you say you want to focus solely on your concerns about AI. You've spoken out saying that AI could manipulate or possibly figure out a way to kill humans. H how could it kill humans? Well, eventually, if it gets to be much smarter than us, it'll be very good at manipulation because it will have learned that from us. And there are very few examples of a more intelligent thing being controlled by a less intelligent thing. And it knows how to program, so it'll figure out ways of getting around um, restrictions we put on it. It'll figure out ways of manipulating people to do what it wants. So what do we do? Do we just need to pull the plug on it right now? Do we need to put in far more restrictions and... and, and uh backstops on this? How do we solve this problem? It's not clear to me that we can solve this problem. Um, I believe we should put a big effort into thinking about ways to solve the problem. I don't have a solution at present. I just want people to be aware that this is a really serious problem and we need to be thinking about it very hard. I don't think we can stop the progress. I didn't sign the petition saying we should stop working on AI because if people in America stop, people in China wouldn't. It's very hard to verify whether people are doing it. There have been some whistleblowers who have been warning about the dangers of AI over the past few years. One of them, um, Timnit Gebru, was forced out of Google for voicing his concerns 
Uh, looking back on it, do you wish that you had stood behind these whistleblowers more? Um, Tim, it's actually a woman. Um, oh, sorry. So they were rather different concerns from mine. Um, I think it's easier to voice concerns if you leave the company first. And their concerns aren't as existentially serious as the idea of these things getting more intelligent than us and taking over. Steve Wozniak, uh, one of the co-founders of Apple, is also speaking out about the dangers he fears uh, will come from AI. Take a listen. Now, AI is another more powerful tool, and it's going to be used by those people, um, you know, for basically uh, really evil purposes. And I hate to see technology being used that way. It shouldn't be. And some, probably some types of regulation are, are needed. It sounds like you agree. Um, what, 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 I agree with that, yes. Yeah, what, what should that regulation look like? I'm not an expert on how to do regulation. I'm just a scientist who suddenly realize that these things are getting smarter than us. Um, and I want to sort of blow the whistle and say, we should worry seriously about how we stop these things getting control over us. Um, and it's going to be very hard. And I don't have the solutions. I wish I did. Does there need to be a, a meeting of, of all of the tech groups and governments working on this, uh, Google, China, whatever, and some sort of set of rules of the road? I mean, how do we even protect against bad actors or, or rogue nations harnessing AI? So for some things, it's very hard, like them using AI for manipulating electorates or for fighting wars with robot soldiers. But for the existential threat of AI taking over, we're all in the same boat. It's bad for all of us. And so we might be able to get China and the US to agree on things like that. It's like nuclear weapons. If there's a nuclear war we all lose, and it's the same if these things take over. So since we're all in the same boat, we should be able to get agreement between China and the U.S. and things like that. Do you think that tech companies will be the solution? Or are they so invested in this financially? And also, let's be frank, in terms of power, uh, that they're not going to be part of the solution here? I think the tech companies are the people most likely to be able to see how to keep this stuff under control. Jeffrey Hinton, thank you so much. Come back. We have more questions for you, and we appreciate your candor. All right. So that is from a very, that warning is from somebody who was the head of AI at Google, who actually quit his job because of what he saw firsthand, uh, how the AI is progressing, and it could shoot off in a direction that's very harmful to everybody. So that's, that's concerning, um, you know, that a guy at his stature and his knowledge of AI actually quit his job, a very lucrative job, to kind of go out and begin warning everybody about the danger, dangerous part of AI. Now, there's other articles recently. So this one, Elon Musk ramps up AI efforts even as he warns of dangers. Oh, so, hi. Yes. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mike. That's okay. Oh, no, never, never mind. My bad, I, I didn't realize you were sharing your screen. Thank you. Oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, if everybody can see what I'm sharing, the, the, the next one was Elon Musk. And he's part of this consortium of investment people that, that started OpenAI, which is the developer of this chat GPT, which we talked about previously. And even Elon Musk is saying, and there's another YouTube video here, but it's, it's a little bit long. It's an interview with him. And even he is saying, okay, so things are getting weird pretty fast. So he, may, he means exactly what Jeffrey Hinton means is exponential growth in AI over the last few years. Uh, they're seeing some kind of warning signals and signs with it. So uh, you can have access to these slides and play this video, but it's a pretty interesting one with Elon Musk. And even though he's an investor in AI, at the same time, he's warning that 
Uh, this is getting kind of weird. Um, the next one is just, uh, um, you know, what we talked about earlier, it's an article on chat GPT and how this type of AI can disrupt education. And I talked about, uh, you know, if these, if these students figure out ways to use chat GPT, I think it's good in some aspects because you can automate things. But in other aspects, if, if they somehow figure out how to uh, finish their, their, uh, their homework and have the chat GPT algorithms do homework for them, I mean, okay, so if they can figure that out, the kid's already really smart, right? But ethically, that's not good. So there's those ethical challenges of AI and chat GPT in the end education world. Uh, so let me go on here. Uh, so real quick, uh, going away from that, I mean, that, that was the kind of scary part of this whole presentation is, is what's happening today. And this has just all gone down in the last couple of weeks. So talking about this seems very apropos right now. One of the cool things I thought was this group of miniature robots that mimic behavior the behavior of insects and swarms. So Eva, if you can play this one real quick. Yep. <clears throat> These are robots that are capable of working in teams. Experts have already developed several hundred of these machines that measure mere centimeters. A colony whose members function as a whole, exhibiting a collective intelligence of sorts, as that of insect communities. This swarm of machines can coordinate collective action flexibly and autonomously. This system's great advantage is that it needs no central control system. The problem with having a centrally controlled system is that if the central computer crashes, the whole system is down. Nothing works. So people are looking for ways to control a large number of autonomous robots. And nature is, of course, the place we automatically look to for guidance. How is it done in nature? With swarms like ants and bees, each individual organizes itself inside the swarm. They flourish as a collective and are able to complete larger tasks. Robots with swarming intelligence. These machines learn, as larger groups of animals do, from their community. A groundbreaking project at the universities of Stuttgart and Karlsruhe even has these micro-robots reproducing. The scientists want to get to the point where the machines develop on their own. Robot evolution of a sort. All the members of the swarm will be programmed almost identically, equipped with a kind of genetic code, if you will. They've been assigned to complete a task-based experiment to find cheese. But first they have to mate. This consists of them exchanging parts of their programming, as in nature, this creates new combinations. This can be good for the individual, but it can also offer disadvantages. The winners of this evolutionary exchange are better equipped, more intelligent than the others. They immediately start navigating the labyrinth in search of cheese. Those who did best are done quickly. In the next phases of the experiment, the robots that perform better can only transfer their programming to lesser robots. This gradually enhances the performance capacity of the entire swarm. This experiment with artificial intelligence reminds us of nightmare science fiction scenarios. Robots who form a collective and are able to exist without human intervention. But robots remain programmed machines that could be used to help search for minds or even help explore and do research in space. <laughs> Thanks, Eva. Sorry. There you go. Sorry about that. That's OK. Uh, so, you know, a uh, little bit interesting, a little bit weird. Uh, it's where we are with AI right now. Um, so let me just kind of kind of closing, getting close to closing up here. So the key takeaways from 
from what we've just kind of learned is the most important general purpose technology in our era is artificial intelligence. And I think that if, if you just kind of put this in the background and you hear it in the news and stuff like that, but don't really pay much attention to it, uh, I think now this is really coming to the forefront and you're gonna hear much more about uh, AI um, then we, you know, as we go along here, uh, and it's all about modeling a predictive behavior, which is what we've learned our predictor, a, a human predictive behavior, right? Uh, AI won't replace workers. It will assist them. And I put, Hmm, in parentheses, because, um, I think that remains to be seen. What's the expected impact of AI on our society? And I got a quote from this Bernard Marr guy. He's a kind of a futurist, world-renowned guy. He said, the transformative impact of artificial intelligence on our society will have far-reaching economic, legal, political, and regulatory implications that we need to be discussing and preparing for. Determining who is at fault if an autonomous vehicle hurts a pedestrian, we've seen that in the case of Tesla, or how to manage a global autonomous arms race are just a couple of examples of the challenges that are to be faced. Will machines become super intelligent and will humans eventually lose control? While there is debate around how likely this scenario will be, we don't know that there are always unforeseen consequences when we introduce new technology. Uh, those unintended outcomes of artificial intelligence will likely challenge us all. So I, I think I, I really liked his quote because we can't be asleep at the wheel. Uh, our government right now, I, I don't know if we hear our leaders talking much about the challenges, the potential dangers, the helpful stuff. And I don't think they're, they're talking enough about artificial intelligence in our society, uh, in our governments and everything like that. So concerns, just, uh, I read a poll and, and put this down here uh, about what the, the concerns are for most people. And, and I saw that people are concerned about misinformation you know, the possibility of, of mistakes. And even though we learned that AI is, can be trained to make, you know, fewer mistakes than humans, you know, to, to get rid of that human error part of it, um, people are still concerned about misinformation coming out of AI. People are concerned about ethics. That's definitely a concern. Uh, in other words, bad actors can get a hold of AI and use it for terrorism or all kinds of stuff, right? People are concerned about the unknowns, uh, the predictive behavior becoming unpredictable, let's put it that way. People are concerned about AI taking our jobs away, definitely. And uh, again, concerns that AI will be used for terrorism and the risks to our privacy. So, Kind of ending this uh, and going back to the chat, Eva Marie, what, uh, everybody, what are your thoughts and concerns? And so I thought we would just take a moment before we close. Uh, I've been doing all of the talking. <laughs> so if you guys want to contribute on the chat and just uh, kind of let's, let's throw this around a little bit and get some of your concerns. Sure. Well, we've had, we've had, um... Let's see, let me go, let me go ahead. Um, excuse me. We've had a lot of great questions coming in. Um, and I was going to, uh, do you mind stop sharing? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> They'd rather see your face than the question. No, I'm just kidding. There we go. Um, so we've had a lot of great questions coming in. Um, and so here's one that was asked, um, why has, uh, if AI has been around for years, why is it just coming into the forefront now? Is that because, and so I'm adding this part, is that because kind of technology has finally caught up? 
Uh, it's because of the exponential growth of technology, right? So I think they called it these winter periods of AI. In other words, where it kind of started out in the 40s, it would, the interest in it and the development of it, they call it the winters of AI. In other words, there's these dark periods where the investment in AI would completely drop off and people would just say, eh, that's too futuristic. It ain't gonna happen. We're concerned with problems now. We're not gonna look at the future. And then all of a sudden it would, would come back again and pop back up again where people would think about it and these pioneers of AI would, would say, hey, you know, this is a thing. And so people, companies would start investing in, in it again, and then it would drop off again. So there was this cyclical thing where the investment into it, the development of it would lag uh, to the past decades. But now in the last probably five years, uh, and maybe even 10, the, exp the, the people are definitely uh, more interested in it. Uh, computer companies use it, governments use it, uh, and we're finding out that there are some really good beneficial uses for it. And it's not just this futuristic thing. There is now a lot of investment in it. And so where the investment is, so is the development. And so uh, I think hopefully I did a good job of that, but there was these winter periods of no investment and no interest. And then, you know, we'd come out of those periods and now we're on this trajectory where there's exponential growth and it's becoming <laughs> a concern now, uh, both good and bad. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. And here's an excellent, uh, an interesting question as well from another student. It's uh, the student writes, all human brains are unique, although I understand there is a similar sameness in all brains. So what brain is AI using? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, um, in other words, are they, are they modeling brain patterns, brain or biological brain behaviors, uh, that, you know, are they looking for patterns that are all the same to model? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, you know, are they looking at trends, right? So uh, AI, say you use it for marketing, right? You're looking for trends. So I think what they're doing is not only this way, but like I, I mentioned with Google that looks at what you do, it looks at your behavior, it's kind of intrusive. They see what you order off of Amazon and then they use that to go after you in a marketing way. So I think uh, that's not the only way they use machine learning and deep learning and neural networks, uh, but I, I but that's a really good question. Are they looking at this huge subset of different people, of different cultures, the way that they think? Uh, where are they getting their information where they're, you know, trying to duplicate uh, our biological brain, the way it thinks and everything? That's a really good question. I mean, you brought up an interesting point too, because if we're talking about AI and how we have people programming at some point, right, uh, humans are having to input something, to, mm -hmm. right? But if we're talking about something globally, imagine, I guess, the computer power, brain power, because you have so many different cultures. So, so you, you know, I mean, I know that's a that's a really really excellent question because she, you're right. We all do think differently. We, some of us think the same but some of us think differently. And then when you go cross culture, right? There's people that have been raised in different cultures and they just have different patterns of thinking. And mm -hmm. so where does artificial intelligence go to get that information, right? Is it a subset? What, how do they do that? That's a really good question. Well, and then, cause you, you think of that if AI is, is eventually, I guess, a goal to be like a global thing, 
you yeah. would have they would have to put some type of human consideration for different cultures, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that's that's just an excellent question. Yeah. Well, um, here is something uh, that I thought was kind of interesting. Another uh, question is um, somebody asked, you know, if we could access AI, but we can, AI is already accessing. I mean, I even think about my my iPhone, right? Right. Just as sure. facial recognition. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm too lazy. I admit it, students, I am too lazy to always put in the code, right? <laughs> um, but do you think eventually th they'll create, or maybe there is a system where if you want certain levels of AI, you'll have to like subscribe to it and then maybe have a special device for it or something? I mean, how 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 do you view that as as one of your grades? Is that is that a good thing to do, or should AI be free and just you know be accessible for all instead of trying to create special AIs? Right. So one thanks Eva Marie for explaining that. That's a good question too. There's as we read about OpenAI, which is this consortium of investment and in smart people like Elon Musk, right, that have developed Chat GPT. As far as I know, open means open, right? So there's open Linux, it's open to anybody, right? And so uh, chat GPT can be accessed by any one of us, right? Um, and I think that's how us, the general public, are gonna be able to have access to it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, yes. It could be both, right? Just like the internet, right? We could use it for good or we could use it for bad. So the big worry is that bad actors like we have in people that infect our computers with viruses, uh, terrorists, um, do they get a hold of this stuff? Because it is open. And so that doesn't mean like, you know, you know, people without bad intentions can have access to it. But yeah, people, they don't know. It's people with bad in intentions can have access to it too. So it's kind of, it goes both ways. And that's the big thing why this, this uh, the guy that I read about, this futurist guy said, there has, to, we can't be asleep at the wheel. There has to be regulations on this. And right now, I think our government is completely asleep at the wheel with regarding the regulations on this and putting limits on it. Mm -hmm. But that can only go so far. Yeah. Um, well, then here's another uh, interesting question that was asked that if AI is being trained on data primarily created by humans yeah. and, and inputted by, by humans, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't AI incorporate human bias biases um, into its knowledge base? Meaning, because as humans, we bring biases with you. Would the AI uh, pick up on that? Yes. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> oh, but there's an argument that that AI is not going to be biased, right? But yeah, that's a good point. AI is only as good as what we're giving it, right? So who's ever developing it, it comes down to those specific developers. Are they inserting their own biases into the training algorithms for AI? I think that's totally possible. So it, it, one of the, it, just real quick, it, one of the concerns when they, when they did this poll was that people we're worried about misinformation, right? So if there's being, if there's biases, if, if there's relative truth that's being inserted into a AI algorithm, then re relative truth is gonna come back out of it, not absolute truth, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, and I, and I guess going back to when, the I'm thinking of the different layers when we're, you were talking about like, is it the neuro learning? or the, the uh, neural networks. networks. Yeah. Oh, right, that. So, um, well, actually, actually, I think you just said it. they just have to be very mindful. I think with m much of anything we see, we have to, we as individuals 
have to still keep our brains working to be mindful of what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, it comes down to, I, I mean, AI has gotten so vast and it's so huge and it's so widely used now. That's one of the reasons why the Jeffrey Hinton guy, the head of Google for AI quit is because he's like, wow, this is like a runaway freight train downhill. And it's going to get so big that it's going to be horribly hard to put any kind of restraints on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, I mean, I won't get into this. It's another controversial subject, but look at gun control laws, right? Uh, what well, do you do about that? It's gotten so big that it's, it's really hard now to stop the, the bad actors uh, and usage of guns, right, to, to kill people. Well, we had a, another student wrote a good point. He said, uh, uh, the student states, problem is that regulation always lags behind the state of the art. Yes. Example, uh, automobile safety standards, you know, govern, government needs to be proactive, which is unusual. Completely agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think- Excellent it's, point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the subject starts first, in this case, AI, and now we're way, way behind and asleep at the wheel as far as figuring out, oh my goodness, we got to put regulations on this. Yeah, absolutely. And so we had another student ask um, uh, an interesting question. Um, for um, super AI, how does compassion or empathy play a role or does it? Um, for super AI, um, that's a good question. Uh, again, that's kind of like inserting our own human biases into AI. Uh, there is no compassion. I, I mean, the way that it's looked at, right? The, the, the information that I dug up, remember when I said there's no drama, right? There's no emotions, right? So in other words, what's supposed to be happening is that this whole AI, these, the neural network, the, you know, the emulation, the modeling of our brain, the way it works, but the machine learning and the deep learning and these algorithms and these patterns and the training, that's supposed to be void of human emotions, right? So when we talk about super AI, I mean, it's supposed to not have any emotions, right? But... Again, like the other person said or asked, human people are programming the AI, right? And we have emotions. So how can it not come back and not have emotions? So I, 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 that's a good question. I don't think I answered it very well, but um, it's, it's hard to say that even super AI would be devoid of um, any kind of emotions. So, that, that, that uncovers a whole new part of AI and it goes into some of these movies that have been made about robots all of a sudden um, developing human emotions, right? <laughs> That's a really, really good point. Well, so then let me um, kind of close up our time together just asking this very simple question. Aren't some decisions best made with a little emotion? I think if you're, I think there's a really good part of our human being is passion, right? I mean, if I look at AI where it's supposed to be a, no emotion, no passion, no drive, no, no love, right? Mm -hmm. um, it just it just seems like if if it's if it's a runaway freight train downhill without those attributes, we're kind of heading for a scary world, for a dark world, for an emotionless world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is that what you're asking, Eva Maria? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. And so, and I, I would agree too. And it goes back to what it's, it's all about what it's going to be used for. Yeah. Medical science, totally great, right? However, 
the thinking part of it and the decision-making part of it and the predictive behavior part of it, um, that's, that remains to be seen. What's that going to look like? And I, I think the next few years are going to be pretty concerning and very interesting to say the least. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Well, uh, Mike, uh, thank you so much. I, I feel sure. like you just kind of gave us the tip of the iceberg. Of yeah, this, this is, this is AI basics, <laughs> but, but we talked about the exponential growth of it and how it's ramped up. And even just the last few weeks, I think it's a very good subject to, to talk about right now. Well, and then one person asked, um, you know, what can we do as a citizen to slow AI down? I think what we can do is just to educate ourselves, to be aware, educate, and be ready with our, our, our base, you know, our education that we learn about, what we learn about AI, to be prepared for that time if we, you know, need to write to our government uh, yeah. officials and such. I guess via voice. Uh, we even have, like we discussed earlier, people like Elon Musk who are investors in AI that are saying, you know, this is getting weird really quickly, right? So we need those kind of voices, right? We need government voices so that, so we, you know, we, we do need to maybe write to our congressmen or somehow, uh, that's a really good question. That's, I think that's one of the best questions that have been asked. What do we do to throw up the red flag about this right now? Yeah. I don't, I don't have a completely good answer about that. Yeah. Well, Eva, Eva Marie, I know you'll probably have one, so maybe you can follow <laughs> up with everybody on, on what to do, but it's a really good question. And it's, it's a question that needs to be answered. Yeah, and, and I, I think it is um, just educate yourself, you know, like with everything. Education can be power for sure. So, uh, Mike, thank you so much again sure. for sharing with us. This was fascinating. I want to thank all the students for all your questions. We didn't have time for all of them, as you, as you can see. The chat was great. A lot of great responses and great insights. So please continue the discussion on the discussion board that will open up in a, at noon. And then um, Mike has also very generously allowed us to have these slides with all the links to all the different videos and, and such. So I will post those uh, later today uh, in this week's module on Canvas. And so you will get an announcement when they're uploaded and ready for your viewing. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Have thank a you great everyone. Oh, what was that, Mike? No, I said thank you, everyone. Oh. <laughs> All right. Have a great week, everybody. Take care.